architecture has lost its value and its meaning in our society. Um, and we need to do we need to do better in promoting the value of architecture. Business of Architecture, episode 204. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today's incredible guest is Meta Omot, co-founder of Omot Plum, a design firm focused on high-end residential design. Meta co-founded Omot Plum with her partner and husband, Andrew Plum. Meta Omot is also the founder of the Slow Space Movement, which you'll hear about in part two of our interview. In this episode, you'll discover the mindset architects need to embrace if they want to make, quote, the big bucks, why doing good work isn't enough to get you hired, and what you really need to be focused on in addition to that. And lastly, but definitely not least, the biggest challenges Meta faced in the early years of her firm. So with that, here's today's episode. Hey, Meta, welcome to the business of architecture. Hey, thanks, Enoch. Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So it was, it was a little bit over a year ago. I was walking down the street with Peter Tui, who's also been on the show, a mutual friend of ours, architect out yeah. of Baltimore. And he said, Enoch, he's like, you, you absolutely have to get Meta and Andrew on the show. Um, and so here we are. So we can say, hey, Peter, it took me this long to convince Meta to come on the business of architecture. Oh, sorry. Was I supposed to invite Andrew? <laughs> no, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We'll That's okay. That for, we'll save that for another episode. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. He's off to a meeting, but uh, okay. Next time. Next time. Well, tell us and tell us about your firm. Tell us how long have you guys been in business? Actually, we're uh, 10 years this year. 10 years. 10 years. Almost. Well, it's uh, we're recording this now in May. 10 years this month. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, what, what date? Do you remember the exact date? I don't know. It was something with a seven. So let's go with either May 7th or May 17th. Okay. Awesome. And so it's literally this month is 10 years. Literally now. this month. Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that calls for a celebration. Yeah. We're going to have a little party um, in, in another couple of weeks. Okay. Cool. Cool. And so tell me about the genesis of the firm. How did this come about? Um, yeah, so a friend of ours, actually my Andrew's college roommate, um, came to us with a project and he wanted to do, um, you know, what was essentially a, a dream project for us, um, and do a beach house. And, uh, you know, he said, do you want to design it? We were both working in firms and, you know, said, yeah, of course we want to design it. Um, so Andrew left the firm that he was working at and I stayed, um, stayed plugged into my corporate job for a little while longer. And we started working on this house, which, uh, which was phenomenal. And we got pretty much through design. And then we uh, were approached by another friend who liked the design we were doing and wanted to do a house as well. And so we said, okay, you know, that's great. Yeah, good enough for us. So I quit my job and we um, found a little office space and just kept going. Um, kept going and, you know, for at least the first five years thought, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just, you know, do this as, you know, as long as we can, we'll just see where it goes. Um, and then, uh, you know, one project led to another, led to another. And then, you know, after a certain amount of time, we said, well, okay, we're really, we're really doing this now. You know, this is, this is going to work and, uh, let's, let's go all in. So, okay. And you know, when you took that moment to get, when you got that second project and decided to leave your corporate job, you know, what were you seeing that made you feel comfortable making that leap in that decision? 
Um, well, I mean, it was a big project. So I knew we had a couple of years of work, um, just on, just on those projects alone. So, and, um, okay. So that was 10 years ago. Okay. I was in my early thirties. We figured, you know, uh, we could always get another job. Actually, this happened right before the, this was, um, 2008, right before the great recession. So, um, things were still booming, um, you know, and everything was going well. And then the bottom fell out. Um, but we were okay because we had our projects and we were just, you know, we were working on those and nothing happened. Um, so, you know, we just figured it was worth a shot and that we really had nothing to lose. Okay. Awesome. And tell me what were the biggest challenges, uh, in the first five years of your firm? Oh God. I remember spending at least a year or more like banging my head against the computer, trying to learn QuickBooks, you know, trying to learn all these um, accounting terms um, that I had never heard of before. You know, I was doing all of that myself. I had a bookkeeper, but I still had to figure out how to do it. Um, so what is accounts payable? What is accounts receivable? What's a profit and loss statement? All of this, this was like totally Greek to me. So I remember just spending hours and hours trying to figure out and teach myself this software. So that was really challenging. Um, um, and then, um, you know, in the beginning, the leap to hiring our first employee, that was kind of a big, um, you know, take a big gulp moment. Um, because once you do that, um, you know, there are a lot of other things that kick in. So, you know, you have workers comp and you need to have, you know, you need to have a payroll system and, you know, it just sort of takes it to another level. And, whether you have one employee or a hundred, you kind of have the same, well, maybe not a hundred, but at least one to 10, you know, you have the same issues. So once you make that leap, that was, um, you know, that was a big threshold. Um, but once we made it, you know, it was fine. We figured out all those systems. Um, and we, you know, we found, we found people to help us, accountants, lawyers and stuff like that. You know, we got all our people lined up pretty early. Okay, so one of the big challenges at first was learning all the that financial mumble jumbo, you know, the accounting terms, the QuickBooks, and oh my goodness, I mean, there's just so much there. With, in addition to that, before you brought on uh, an employee, was there anything else that you remember really struggling with in those first couple of years of building the firm? You know, we weren't really building the firm in the first couple of years, to be honest. I mean, we, you know, we were doing, we had to figure out the invoicing and the QuickBooks and stuff like that, but we weren't building the firm. We were just heads down um, doing our projects and we were focused first and foremost on doing the best possible job we could do. And what was it going to take to get these projects um, done and what was, you know, and what was it going to take to do them in the best possible way? So we weren't really thinking about systems and business, you know, we were just kind of getting by with what we needed to. We needed to set up an LLC, so we figured out how to do that. We needed to send invoices, so we figured out how to do that. So it was kind of one step at a time. I remember buying a stack of books um, like this on, you know, how to start a business, and I never read them, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I read many other ones later, but those those were those were just like silly ones. But I remember one of them. Um, the title of one of them was. Um, oops, I'm in business. And that's kind of how it felt. <laughs> and so we were suddenly in business and we were figuring out all these things like literally as we went. Um, and so, yeah, there was no conscious building a firm. It was just trying to keep our heads above water. Okay. So it sounds like you had some breathing room there for the first couple of years. You wanted to focus on just delivering an exceptional project. When yeah. did you, what was it that made you look at this firm you were, you were, running at the time and decide that it was time to hire on some staff? Um, well, we hired staff just as we needed, um, uh, you know, as we needed for the projects and, you know, to get the work done. And we tried to hire the best um, staff we could. And we, we ended up with some great people. Um, and, um, you know, but I would say it wasn't really until those initial contacts um, had those initial projects had finished up and, um, you know, we we had we had started to get some publicity, but, you know, we we're getting a little slow for work. It wasn't really until that point where we really figured out we needed to 
learn how to hustle and we needed to learn how to um, bring in a steady stream of uh, clients and projects. And that was really where, when the shift happened. Um, so when we realized that um, actually having your, you know, just getting a dream project is not enough to, um, to start and maintain a firm. Like it's a good start. You, you have to have that. Um, and we did a great job. It got published. It got awards and all those kind of, kind of things. The second project, great, you know, great project. The third project, but it doesn't just, it doesn't just take off from there. I mean, it's in some cases, maybe it does, but it didn't for us. It didn't just like, it didn't just go on autopilot after that. So then we really had to figure out, okay, what are we doing here? Like, what does it really mean to run a business? What is, you know, um, what is this thing called marketing? Um, you know, what is, how do we get more clients? Well, tell me, tell me about your evolution from that point to where you are now. Tell me some of the lessons you've learned along the way and what you feel that you've grown into. Yeah. So, you know, really early, well, I, I don't remember what year it was, but at some point when I knew that we needed to, we need to figure out about marketing, I just started Googling marketing uh, for architects and I found you guys in the Architects Marketing Institute. Um, and at the time that was, that was the only show in town. I mean, that was the only thing I was seeing um, and I didn't really know where to start. So it gave me a really good, um, I had been reading some books, some business books, and everything that Architects Marketing was talking about what resonated with some of the stuff that I'd read. So I was like, okay, you know, this makes sense to me. Um, so I just, you know, I just went all in and I just tried to learn as much as I could about that. Um, and so that was really the key at the beginning is like learning about how to, um, you know, how, how to, how to talk about ourselves. And then it started me thinking a lot about, um, how we actually, how we practice architecture and about how we, um, differentiate ourselves from all the other architects out there doing, you know, very similar things. Um, because we learned as we started going for um, going to interviews that our design was not a differentiator, um, our high quality design. So if we had, if we were, if we were at the table, you know, we had already been, uh, we had already been vetted and we'd already been selected and we were, you know, with among a group of, you know, just a couple of architects, all very good designers. And um, the difference between them was a little bit lost on some clients. And so, you know, it wasn't really about that anymore. Um, you know, uh, who they decided to go with wasn't about like who was the best designer. Um, so, you know, sometimes it was about, you know, who spoke to them about the, the process that they wanted to use for the construction, who did, or it was, who did they feel most comfortable with or who made them feel like, you know, their budget was enough money for their project or whatever, you know, it, every time it was kind of something different, but it was it wasn't about the um, design quality. So we realized we needed to understand these other aspects, um, and we needed to really think about how we wanted to, um, you know, how we wanted to be different from everybody else. Well, in this conference, you know, this this concept of differentiation is so incredibly important. And you know, what have you learned about that? How have you been able to use that in the way you present your work? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it. Um, it allowed us to seriously think about specializing. Um, I mean, this is something that for Andrew took him much, much longer to come around to the idea. But, um, you know, we we finally understood that um, specializing in homes is a good thing and it doesn't necessarily close off other opportunities. We do other projects if they come along, but we, um, we're really, we're really very good at that. And we're experts at that. Um, and, um, you know, it helps us in multiple ways. You know, we can, um, you know, we can demonstrate our expertise to clients, but we can also, um, we can also develop a certain kind of efficiency in our process that allows us to be more profitable. Um, and so every time we would switch to a new project type, you know, the learning curve is huge and steep. And, you know, we've, we've done, um, you know, we've done private residential, we've done public housing, we've done um, office interiors. Each one of those things has its own 
rule book. Well, I wish there was a rule book. There isn't, but you know, it should have its own rule book. The specs are totally different. You know, the bidding process is totally different. You know, it's a completely different animal. So by focusing on one area, you get really good at that. And then you can actually, um, you can actually go much deeper into it. Um, and so we can get really, really good at, um, at doing something. So it was about, it was about going very deep into one area, um, and about recognizing the benefit, not only to our clients, but also to ourselves, you know, and to how, um, you know, how we were, how we could live our life, you know, how we could live a well-balanced life, um, where we weren't working all the time, because that's a very important value to us. Um, you know, we, we have a family, I have MS, we leave work at five o'clock. I mean, this is like, it's kind of a, one of the rules we set out at the beginning. And so by specializing, it allows us to really capitalize on the knowledge that we've, um, that we've attained over time, uh, and really use that and leverage it, uh, in a much better way. Okay. Well, you just kind of threw in there that you have MS. Why don't you explain to our listeners what that, what that is and what that means for you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, MS stands for multiple sclerosis. And I was, um, I, I got it in architecture school along with my degree. Um, I say that a little tongue in cheek, uh, a little bit not because, um, the stress of architecture sc- school definitely put me over the edge or put my body over the edge. I'm the kind of person that internalizes all the stress. I'm a, you know, type A person. I was at Harvard. Everyone else was type A too. Everyone else was superb, the best in, you know, the best in their class. And we were, there we were a whole bunch of high achievers. Um, and we were all being told we sucked. So we're like, (laughs) you know, doubling down, working extra hard. Um, and so, you know, the, the stress is, it's a long program. It was almost four years. So, uh, halfway through, I was having, I was having pain that, you know, nobody could really diagnose. And by the, um, by the end, I was finishing my thesis and, um, and I went blind in my right eye. It was the kind of thing where I was in the middle of thesis and I was just like, oh, I must just be tired. You know, the kind of things you say to yourself when you're like half delirious. So, um, I was like, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll go to the doctor after my final review. Um, and so, uh, and that was a classic, um, optic neuritis. My eyesight did come back, um, but that's a classic sign or symptom of MS. So that's how I ended up at a neurologist and I ended up getting that diagnosis right after my, uh, graduation. So, I mean, at this point I was already, completely burned out and fried. Um, and so I was already looking for jobs that were going to let me work a 40 hour week and learn as much as I could, but not, um, you know, not, I I didn't want to be, you know, in the grinder anymore. Um, and this kind of confirmed it. Um, but for a long time I kept it a secret. Um, you know, this was something Andrew and I were already, um, we were already together at this point and, you know, um, I didn't want to tell anyone that I didn't want to tell the person who I was going to go and work for, you know, that I had this diagnosis. Like I didn't know what it was going to turn out to be. Uh, I didn't know what kind of effect it was going to have on my life. So I actually kept it a secret from, you know, the call it the general public. I mean, all my friends and family knew, but I kept it a secret professionally uh, for about 10 years. Um, and then it wasn't until we were comfortable in our own firm that I, you know, and, and I'd had it long enough to feel like, okay, I, I think I, I kind of I figured out how to manage this and I can kind of see um, the prognosis. You don't know at the beginning if it's going to be a quick decline or it's going to go on a, it's going to go on a downward trajectory. Like that's, there's going to be more and more disability over time, but is that going to be a steep slope or is it going to be a very gradual one? And so I can, I can affect that by how I manage my stress and manage my life. So, um, if I can reduce the amount of flare ups, I can reduce the amount of disability that, uh, accumulates over time. And so that was a, you know, that was just kind of a given, you know, graduated from architecture school. I had my diploma and I had my diagnosis and I was like, had to figure out how to make these two things go together that, 
typically don't go very well together because, you know, the 80 hours a week in architecture, you know, working as an architect is not uncommon, especially when you start out. Um, and so I realized that we had, we had to kind of figure out a different way to do this. Like we still wanted to do work that we loved. Um, and we still wanted to, you know, make a good living and we wanted to have a good life. So that was this trifecta that everybody kind of said, oh yeah, that sounds really nice. Like pipe dream, you know, pie in the sky kind of thing. Um, but we were, you know, that, that that's what we wanted. You know, so we were going to figure out how to do it. Meta, how do you feel that this challenge has made you a stronger person? Oh, God. Yeah, definitely. Um, how? I mean, you know, not so much anymore, but for the first five years, I, I lived with pain every day. Um, and so, you know, you... You don't think, take things for granted anymore. Um, when I was in pain, you know, I would look, I would see other people and I, I would just immediately think, I wonder what they're going through. So like, it just gave me a, a lot of empathy. Um, and it also forced me to, um, really like remove, um, negativity and stressors and things that, um, you know, uh, people from my life that were kind of bringing me down or just things in my life that were bringing me down. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't want that. I, you know, I had enough stuff like this is already bringing me down. So like, I didn't want any other things to bring me down. So, um, so, you know, and then, and then just figuring out how to slow down, um, you know, how to do less, but do it better. Um, you know, say no to things. Um, you know, I mean, we, we still have a family we have two young kids and they take an enormous amount of energy. You know, how do I, how do I do that and run a business and, you know, have MS, uh, you know, it's been trial and error for, um, you know, 10, 15 years uh, trying to figure out how to do that with a sort of very, um, you know, I didn't have a choice. I mean, a very sort of persistent, um, you know, trying, trying things, failing and trying again. Um, so I, you know, I feel like, um, you know, it's still something that I, I still have MS. It's never going to go away. Um, and I still have symptoms on a daily basis. Um, but I feel very, uh, lucky to be in a place where uh, I'm managing it and I'm still able to do most of the things that I want to do, but I can't do all of the things I want to do. I mean, if, if regardless of what happened with my diagnosis, if I, if I ever tried to do all the things I want to do, I mean, I would probably have had a heart attack anyway. You know, I wanted to do so many things. Um, and so it really forced me to, um, you know, prioritize and like throw away my checklists and my to-do lists, you know, and say, okay, you know, I'm never going to get to the bottom of this to-do list. Like what's really important? Well, tell me, so you've had to set these boundaries in your life due to this, what have you called this blessing, this disability, this challenge, whatever, you know, there's all, all sorts of things about that. But what would you say, you know, what's the secret to creating these boundaries? Because I know that a lot of other, you know, a lot of people we all struggle with, yeah. Our tasks fill to, yeah. to the allotted space we have for them. So what would you say is the secret that you've learned about managing your time and having that balance? Uh, you just have to, um, well, you just have to, there's no, like, you just have to, there's no, <laughs> there's no silver bullet. There's no one secret. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, so there, there's no one secret. I mean, it, it's actually hard work. Um, it's actually hard work editing out all of the, uh, all of the noise, um, all of the noise of life and all the, all the various requests on your time and, you know, interesting opportunities and, um, things like that. It's very difficult for anyone who's curious and interested to say no to all these things. And I mean, I have to say no to, I probably should say no to more things. I mean, I need to say no to the vast majority of things that cross, um, cross my desk or, you know, cross my table in my life. Um, and that's kind of a bummer in a way. So, but you have to change your mindset about that too. Um, 
because you have to think about, okay, if I'm saying no to that, what am I saying yes to? Well, I'm saying yes to um, hanging out on the couch with my kids and being goofy, you know? So like the kind of stuff, it's like, it's not specific and tangible, um, you know, but it's like, I'm saying yes to being in a good mood and not being tired <laughs> is what I'm saying yes to, you know, and like being, you know, a, being a better, um, being a better friend because, um, so for me, I get, um, I get very tired very easily. So I had to say no to these things. So when I get tired, I get grumpy, you know, when I get grumpy, I'm a bitch and no, you know, and that's not good for anybody. And so, you know, I have to, I have to be on the offensive to like say no to these things and remember that like, if I don't, you know, um, the people around me are going to suffer because they're going to have to deal with me in a very not, uh, ideal state. So when you were in Austin, you gave, we had the architect business development summit there in Austin. You gave a very uh, emotional, well, I would say it was a, it was a captivating presentation, but one of the themes in there was that you've been very intentional about saying no to certain kind of projects and only accepting certain kind of projects. And you said that that, that put you in some compression. It made it harder for you guys. Uh, to tell us, tell me about that because I talked to so many architecture firm owners, and just the other day I had one telling me, "Enoch, this guy called me. He's trying to, you know, price shot me. He just wants me to do some plans, and I feel like I have to take that project." Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? As it relates to building uh, a world class yeah. design firm. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, I think you should, you definitely need to follow your instincts. And if you have red flags about clients, you know, you definitely like, like that, the price shopping, you should definitely say no. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the amount of effort we end up putting into a project is just enormous because we always want to do a good job. Um, and so, you know, if that other architect is anything like me, if I say yes to something, I'm going to do a great job no matter what, ha you know, no matter what happens. I make a promise, I'm going to follow through on it. Um, so when you say yes, that takes like two seconds to say yes, but then you've committed yourself for two years worth of, you know, a relationship or an engagement or whatever. So you got to be really careful. But on the other hand, you know, you, you need to like stay alive and, you know, as, as a business and keep the doors open. Um, lately I've been really thinking that it's much better to stay small, um, as a firm. So right now we're four people and Andrew and myself and two other excellent people. And, um, I'm not interested in growing right now. Um, it's funny because I feel a lot of pressure to grow you know, one of the um, metrics of success that people always, you know, that I think people are always asking me, so how big are you guys now? Like, as if the size of our firm, you know, re correlated to our success. And, um, you know, I realized that if, if we grew, I would just have to take on a lot more projects that I didn't want to take on because I needed to support the staff. So, Instead, I know that the, the client, the best clients for us, they're very few and far between. Um, and so I'd rather stay small and lean and wait for the, the great projects than grow big and then have to keep that machine churning, um, to, and, and just kind of take in everything. So, you know, I don't know if you're a sole practitioner, you don't have the option, you know, with that, but if you're a firm of a few people, you can decide, you know, um, what's, what's the right number and what are you trading, you know, by taking that, taking that project on. So I was, I was interviewing Mark Kushner, who is a mutual friend of ours. We both know Mark and I was talking with him. He's a, a great entrepreneur, a great architect, runs a great firm out of, uh, with offices, but one office in New York. And, you know, he comes from a, a wealthy family. His family has a wealthy background. And so I asked him about that. I said, Hey, Mark, you know, did the fact that your family was, had means, do you think that affected your life as an architect or your success? And he said something really interesting. He said, you know, Enoch, it, uh, it wasn't that they were going to invest money in my business or that they were going to bail me out or anything like that. But what it did give me is it gave me a certain amount of confidence because I knew that if anything happened and I came on rough times, I could always go back and live with them and I, would, I wouldn't I would be on the streets, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said that 
that confidence allowed me to have and take a lot of risk that I think other people might be hesitant to take. And I'm just yeah. curious to get your take on that. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, I'm I'm sure that's true. Um, you know, I don't come from a wealthy family, but we had a couple of, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, a rough year and my mom bailed us out, you know, and helped us. So, you know, that was something, wasn't something I knew was going to happen because um, you know, we're not wealthy by any stretch. But, um, you know, I was thankful that she did. I think that, you know, that makes me understand why a lot of people teach or why a lot of a lot of people kind of diversify their um, their practice in a way, um, not necessarily by having different um, by having different project types, but by teaching or by doing something else on the side. Um, and actually, Andrew's going to start teaching in the fall at at Harvard. So we thought about that too. Like, Hey, maybe that's a good idea to have like some other sort of income stream that's stable and consistent, you know, just to give us a little bit of cushion to, um, you know, to kind of weather the storms. And we, we had always thought that way as well. Um, and, you know, and we, and we tried to always maintain like a pretty healthy cushion in our, in our bank account for the business, just so that we're not, um, you know, we don't have the stress of, of worrying about making the next payroll. Um, and so, you know, it, it's great to, it's great to set yourself up in a way that allows you some freedom. So you don't have to take everything that comes if you can do it. You know, it's like, we can't all be that lucky. Well, in a sense, in a sense, we live in America. And even if you fall on hard times, you're not going to starve. Right. You're so, not going to starve. Yeah. I don't know that weren't there were some starving architects during the Great Recession. <laughs> I don't know. Some of your listeners might be like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think things got pretty rough. Well, I know they did. You know, for me, I mean, if there was a starving architect, I was probably one of them because I had to have uh -huh. two side jobs. I was throwing newspapers in the middle of the night. I was yeah. doing substitute teaching because I moved home where there was absolutely, I mean, there were no jobs. It was decimated. So yeah, yeah. I know that. But yeah. I think that, you know, we all have this survival fear in our head that, that drives us to either succeed and do things like kind of this animal instinct that we don't want to perish. And I, the question I'm curious about, and I'm curious in your take on this is, does that desire to just survive sometimes prevent us from building and, you know, saying yes to the kind of products we don't want at the exclusion of maybe some other projects that we, we do want. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think so. And I, I actually think, um, I actually think there's like some weird, uh, psychology within the architecture profession that makes that particularly, um, particularly difficult. I don't know what it is, but we're a pretty risk averse bunch. Um, don't like to go out on a limb. And uh, we, in general, we go for pretty much any project that comes along. Um, and so, you know, don't want to rock the boat, um, you know, maintain the status quo, you know, okay, let's just all get along kind of, uh, kind of people. Very nice, very nice bunch, but very, like generally pretty risk averse. And for those of us who've started businesses, we're actually entrepreneurs, whether we know it or not. Um, and so, you know, there's that, um, Oh, what's that great book? Um, you know, the great book that says, um, you know, you can start out as a technician, you just do your, um, the E myth, the E myth, the E stands for the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial myth. Uh, I recommend that book highly to any architect who is thinking about or has started their own firm, because you think that you're just going to hang a shingle and you're just going to go about um, you know, doing your architecture, at, you know, but on your own, you're not gonna have a boss. Oh, great. You know, that's, that's awesome. Um, but you're actually you actually need to be an entrepreneur. And to be an entrepreneur, you need to, um, you need to be comfortable with some risk. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, well, I don't know about other businesses, but I'm pretty sure that entrepreneurs that play it safe, they don't make the big bucks. So, uh, you know, so there's, there's a, um, there's a problem there. Um, there's a problem there between like, you know, 
us architects and like what we need to do, you know, how we are naturally and how, what we need to do in order to be successful. We need to be risk takers. We need to go bold. Um, you know, we need to put ourselves out there. We need to have opinions and speak them loudly. Um, and we need to, and we need to risk people not liking us. And all that is very difficult. Well, Meta, you've been you were you were with us in the Architect Marketing Academy, maybe one of the the second cohort, I think. So for you've been working with uh, the Architect Marketing Institute for a long time with me and Eric Bobber, Richard Petrie. What were some of the? You said you went through that process, you learned through that. What would you say were some of your biggest takeaways from working with us in that program? Oh, um, I I mean I learned so much. It was like you know it was marketing one hundred and one. Um, it was like it really got me thinking and thinking in ways not just about marketing but in about about business um, that I had never thought about before. I mean it was like um, you know it, and I went through I went through the courses. I actually went through them twice. I mean I was trying to wring out every last bit of, um, you know, every juicy bit I could out of the whole thing. So, I mean, it's like, I really, um, drank the Kool-Aid and the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, so what is like the one or two takeaways? Um, (laughs) number one, marketing is important. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're running a business here, you know, I mean, I don't know that this like seems kind of obvious, but it's not. Um, and what's the other thing? Um, yeah, what, you know, figure out what's special about, about us, about you figure out what's special and what's unique and play to that play to your strength. Um, and you know, and, and go for it. Well, you, so you say you're running a business here and you say, it just sounds, it sounds kind of simple, but what does that actually mean to you when you say, Hey, we're running a business here. Uh, Yeah, right. Um, Like that we have an organizational structure, that we have systems and processes that we follow, that we, um, you know, we're we're a small firm, like I said, four people, but we have this mindset of a big firm, a big corporate mindset. And so, um, you know, we have... uh, you know, we have a pay structure, we have, uh, we have benefits, we have, um, you know, we have, uh, I'm the CEO, we have an organizational chart, you know, we have job roles, we have, um, you know, we have standards, we have CAD standards, we have systems for setting up drawings, like, uh, a lot of small firms, because I've worked for them, it's a little bit like, even big firms, sadly enough, each project has their own set of CAD standards. You know, each project has each project, each project's project manager runs it in a slightly different way, you know. And so each time we're, they're kind of reinventing the wheel. And so they lose a lot of efficiency that way. And <clears throat> efficiency sounds like a bad word for a boutique architecture firm, but actually, um, what it allows us to do is spend more time on design because we're not spending all that extra time reinventing the process, reinventing the wheel um, from one time to the next. We have more time to spend on the stuff that we love. So, you know, recently Andrew's come up with, um, he's come up with kind of a, an overall system for our, um, for our initial design meetings. So, We've got, here's like four or five design meetings. The first one is the big picture. He, he knows for every project, he knows what he needs to present, what decisions he needs to get made, you know, what materials he needs to produce for that first meeting. The second meeting is space, line, and form. Here are the types of, you know, here are the types of um, drawings we're going to produce for that. Here are the types of decisions that we need to get out of the clients for that. And it has taken so much, um, guesswork and stress out of the process for him that he's like happily sketching all day long. You know, he's got this, um, he's got this, um, Microsoft surface computer with the pen and he's uh, sketching on that thing. So he has just tons more time to design because he's not fretting about, Oh, what do I have to produce for this next meeting? He knows exactly what he needs to produce and he can spend that time being creative. 
So that that's a win win for us, you know, and for our clients. That is that is truly awesome, uh, Meta. You are in, in addition to the firm. You're also heavily involved in promoting a new movement that kind of aligns with your thoughts and your values. And we're going to jump into that in our second segment. But before we do that, let's just wrap up this conversation. If you could give me two, three, or four kind of key takeaways from these past ten years big lessons or big pivots in your business that you really felt helped streamline things, help make things easier or better, you know, key takeaways. And feel free to think about this for a minute because I know I'm asking you this on the spot, but what would those things be? Actually, I'm just going to regurgitate an answer I gave the other day. Um, I was at Harvard and I was a guest critic on a review for, um, for a class that Man, I wish they had had when I was there. It was called um, the practice as project. So it was about setting up your architecture firm and, um, you know, uh, coming up with your business plan. And this was the final review. So this was... Um, so this was, uh, they were, they were, um, doing a mock RFP and they were presenting themselves to a client for selection or whatever. So, um, at the end of the whole thing, after we'd seen all of the reviews, you know, I said to them, I said, guys, you know, I, most of you are just doing the same thing that architects have always done. You know, it, it's like, um, you know, either it's like a man and a woman, you know, team, and we are architects X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we are, um, you know, thoughtful and uh, we listen to our clients and, you know, the same kind of thing that everybody says. Um, and I said, you know, um, I said a good analogy is for practice today is uh, if you think back to um, the turn of the century, the uh, you know turn of the 20th century, 1900, and, and a man or a woman of means uh, wants to get uh, a new dress or a suit. They go to the tailor or the dressmaker. They bring a few images with them that they've pulled out of magazines. The tailor takes their measurements. <laughs> You know, uh, they go away, they do a few sketches, they come back, they show them the sketches. Oh, great. Yeah, that looks good. I've got a few comments. They go away, they come back, they have a new dress uh, or suit. Like, that's exactly how we're practicing still today. And it's been more than 100 years since the fashion industry has moved on. And we're still doing bespoke suits. And so, you know, there is so much room for innovation in the practice of architecture and the slate is clean. I mean, it is like blank and wide open. Like guys, just think outside the box here. Think, uh, you know, think about other industries and how they're doing things. Like, you know, you could innovate. There's like a million ways you could innovate and you would be, you would be so cutting edge if you thought about it on the side of practice and not on the side of design, you know, that there's just so much room there. And, you know, you could be the first one to do, to do it this way or that way. I don't know what, you know, um, but just, just do it differently. Just, you know, business as usual. It, uh, one of my mantras is like, I'm, however I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it the way that other architects do it. Like, I know how that works. And actually, it's failing us terribly. I mean, we're losing market share. I mean, you know, we're down to like the dregs at the bottom of the barrel, um, you know, the competing on price. I mean, we've got this few crumbs left. You know, the way we've been doing it is not working. So just find a different way. Try a different way of doing it. Um, you know, study other businesses, you know, read business books, like great business books from, you know, real business people and <laughs> just try to do it different. Real business people as opposed to dot, 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 dot. Well, well as opposed to us, we're not real business people. We, we don't have a clue, right? So you, you had an interesting post on Facebook. It was, should have been six months ago or so where you were talking about the process of going through this, uh, you were going for a project and there was some undercutting happening or something like that. Vaguely, okay. vaguely strikes my memory. You yeah. Know, when you talk about going to the dregs and getting down to the bottom and how we're just cutting each other's, you know, throats and everything. Talk to me about your perspective on that. What do you mean by that? Um, well, okay. So there's some statistic already that's like only 2% of buildings worldwide are designed by architects. Um, and so, 
already we're fighting over the last crumbs. Um, and then, you know, the juicy projects these ga- these days are going to the star architects or, you know, the celebrity architects, the ones that are really well known. So, OK, take away all the juicy projects, um, you know, the high budget project, you know, probably put that in the juicy projects category. And so, you know, and then it just sort of like trickles down further and further and further. And then, you know, you've got clients, a lot of potential clients throughout the country that don't really understand, um, that don't think they need an architect um, and don't really understand the value. We're not making a good you know, case for that. Um, and so, you know, whatever's left is just, it, there's very little. And yeah, that, that story that I posted, um, we had this, we had this project, we were already working with this client and uh, we proposed and they decided, no, you know what, instead of renovating this house, we're going to tear it down and we're going to build new. And, um, you know, we said, great, okay, um, you know, we can help you with that. Um, and so we gave them our fee, which was actually the same rate, it was 15%, I'm happy to share that, it was the same rate we were charging them for the renovation. We said, okay, you know, same rate, you know, on this budget. And they, and they kind of balked. And then they went shopping around and they found this other guy, a very well-established architect, um, you know, late in his career, he's got plenty of jobs, and most of what he does is institutional projects. And he said, yeah, I'll do it for 10% because this is just fun for me. And he, w- he, was, he basically told them that he's going to subsidize um, their project with his other more lucrative projects. And I mean, man, that was unfair. That was so incredibly unfair. I mean, seriously, guy, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's not even, uh, he admitted that's not even a 10% is not even a fair price because he admitted that he was going to uh, lose money on it. And, um, and so, you know, it's sort of like, wow, it's just, it's just pathetic. <laughs> and what would you, what do you think the antidote for that is? What's the fix? Um, what's the fix? What's the fix? Um, the fix is <laughs> the fix is the slow space movement. Now, the fix is uh, the fix is that we need to um, <sighs> architecture has lost its value and its meaning in our society, um, and we need to do we need to do better in promoting the value of architecture and quality construction and, um, you know, the built environment, because most of what, um, most people, their options are most, most people, they don't, well, they may not know what an architect does, or they don't, may not have, may not be able to afford it. But even people who do, they don't necessarily um, want to wait or go through the pot process. So they're happy to just take kind of what's already out on the market. And I'm thinking about like, you know, single family homes or whatever. And, you know, their choices are extremely limited. It's only what developers build. And it's mostly McMansions, which I call junk space. I mean, you know, it's called the McMansion for a reason, because it's like the McDonald's of, of architecture. Um, and so everybody, not everybody, we know it's crap. Um, you know, uh, the general public doesn't necessarily know it's crap, but it is crap. We need to tell them that it's crap. You know, it's like they're eating McDonald's um, every single day and it could be so much better. And so, you know, because architects are pretty timid, we don't, we're not going to, or well, I am, but other people are not necessarily going to stand up and, you know, and protest and say, no, this is bad. This is wrong. Here's why it's bad for you. Um, and I think we need to start doing that. And I'm happy to, you know, be the person out front uh, with the bullhorn and, and saying that if like other people will kind of gather around and, you know, I know 
all the other architects are nodding their heads saying, yes, I know it's crap. It's awful. Like, look what it's doing to us, you know? So it's all clad in PVC. You know, this is like a horrible PVC is a known carcinogen and neurotoxin. You know, it's like vinyl siding is, you know, the worst thing for people and the environment. And it looks horrible. I mean, we all know it. And so why are we, why are we specking it? We just have to, we just have to stand up for ourselves. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.